can you hear me? I thought I was being fired upon there during that video. <laughs> Technical things, it happens. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. I'm also excited to be continuing in our Corinthian series. This is where we are looking at the biblical books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, letters actually from Paul, the apostle to the church in Corinth, where they're experiencing a lot of issues. Some would call them crazy, so we are asking the overlying question throughout this whole series, are we any different today? Good question. I think we got the answer already because we're nine chapters in. <laughs> we should have figured that out, huh? <clears throat> Maybe we have to ask another question. I don't know. I'll come up with something. So as we've talked about before, there are often overlying themes throughout many chapters of biblical books. One through four, we had this theme of disunity caused by following after worldly leaders instead of Jesus, worldly wisdom instead of the wisdom of God. Five through seven, sex. We had sexual issues. Chapter five, six, we got to seven as it pertains to marriage, remarriage, and divorce. Chapter eight, last week, we arrived at meat sacrifice to idols. If that sounds really weird to you, it's okay. It should. I hope you're not sacrificing any animals to idols. If you want to get caught up, you can go through our app and you can listen to or watch last week's message where I described it for you. We find ourselves in chapter 9. Paul's going to make a little bit of a digression. He's going to make a little bit of a turn. He's going to draw some attention to something else in chapter 9, but it's still within that theme of meat sacrificed to idols. Throughout these books, we also see another theme. It's really important. The Corinthians are proposing something, what we would call today maybe greasy grace. They're saying something to him like, everything's permissible, right? Jesus died for all our sins, so we can just sin all we want. Everything is permissible. So Paul is addressing them, like in quotations, yeah, everything's permissible, but not everything is profitable. And so we're going to see that come up time and time again. There's the gospel, gospel issues that we talked about last week, the primary stuff, and then everything else. So last week, I identified that for you, what the gospel is, but today... We're going to take a look at some of that other stuff. So last week I gave you the good news. This week I'm going to give you the other news. Not that it's not good news. So here we're going to see that Paul, he's not taking a salary from the Corinthians. So it's permissible for him to take a salary, but in this case it's not exactly profitable. And this is going to be an issue that keeps coming up. So let's just look at the text in chapter 9 at first, and then I'll kind of unpack it for you. 1 Corinthians 9, starting at verse 1, Paul writes this, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle to others, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me is this. Don't we have the right to eat and drink? Don't we have the right to be accompanied by a Christian wife like the other apostles, the Lord's brothers and Cephas, that's Peter, or do Barnabas and I alone have no right to refrain from working? Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat its fruit, or who shepherds a flock and does not drink the milk from the flock? Am I saying this from a human perspective? Doesn't the law also say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it treads out grain. Now, is God really concerned with oxen, or isn't he really saying it for us? Yes, this is written for us, because he who plows ought to plow in hope, and he who threshes should do so in hope of sharing the crop. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it too much if we reap material benefits from you? If others have this right to receive benefits from you, don't we even more? So, the bridge here, from the end of chapter 8 to the beginning of chapter 9, is sacrificing things for others. Right, so, the overlying topic, again, Meat sacrifice to idols, but chapter 9 represents a digression from the topic of meat sacrifice to idols, but it is on the topic of giving things up. Because he says, like, he'll give up meat. Now he's also given up taking money. Like the meat, he has the right to take it if he wants, but he doesn't. Look what he writes. 1 Corinthians 9 12. However, 
We have not made use of this right. Instead, we endure everything so that we will not hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who perform the temple services eat the food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in the offerings at the altar. In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who preach the gospel should earn their living by the gospel. So why then, if this is Paul's right, even commanded by the Lord, as he says, why does he give it up? Why doesn't he do it? Why doesn't he take it? False teachers. As we continue through the series, we're going to see that there are these false teachers roaming around the church in Corinth who Paul sarcastically calls super apostles. All right, so you'll kind of make fun of them. Paul is trying to show them up. He's trying to say, well, I'll do it for free. Will they do it for free? Or are they just in it for the money? So let's jump ahead and we'll take a little look in 2 Corinthians where this really comes up. It gets a little explosive, actually. <laughs> So he writes this in 2 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 5. Now I consider myself in no way inferior to the super apostles. Though untrained in public speaking, I am certainly not untrained in knowledge. Indeed, we have always made that clear to you in everything. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by taking pay from them to minister to you. So clearly we see some sarcasm here. Paul's not a thief, right? He didn't rob the other churches, but he does imply that maybe he committed a sin by not doing as the Lord commanded. 2 Corinthians eleven twelve. 12, he continues, but I will continue to do what I am doing in order to deny the opportunity of those who want an opportunity to be regarded just as our equals in what they boast about. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. So again, jumping back where we were, the idea of giving up meat is that Paul would give up something he would enjoy for the sake of others. Now here, he's giving up the money for the sake of the gospel. And that's going to be what we're going to take a look at this morning. We talked about the gospel being the main thing, right? Here, he is giving up his very right to make a living for the sake of the gospel. In fact, He'll do anything short of sin for the sake of the gospel. Back in chapter 9, this is what he gets into. 9, starting at verse 19. Although I am a free man and not anyone's slave, I have made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews to those under the law. Like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, to win those under the law. To those who are without the law, like one without the law not being without God's law, but within Christ's law to win those without the law. To the weak I became weak in order to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that I may by every possible means save some. Now, I do all this because of the gospel, so I may become a partner in its benefits. Logical question now. We need to look at pastors, leaders in the church, and ask, would they too do all things for the sake of the gospel? And so, we have standards for leadership in church. Although all Christians should be striving for a higher standard, some of these standards are not optional, and they're higher for pastors, for elders, leaders in the church. Paul writes this to Titus, and it kind of sets the scenario here. The reason I left you in Crete, Titus, was to set right what was left undone, and as I directed you to appoint elders in every town. Here we go. One who is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of wildness or rebellion. For an overseer, as God's administrator, must be blameless, not arrogant, not hot-tempered, not addicted to wine, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled, holding to the faithful messages taught so that he will be able both to encourage with sound teaching and refute those who contradict it. Pastors, elders, leaders in the church are not to be greedy for money. If they are, they disqualify themselves, biblically speaking. So now we have to ask the question, what does greedy for money look like? 
It seems like here in America, that's a very flexible term, isn't it? <clears throat> I like to be pra practical about it. A living is whatever the average salary for that job where the church is located in that particular city is. Makes sense, right? Don't we agree? If you're making the average salary, what the other pastors are making seems pretty good, unless we make, all make a deal, right? So like make four times as much. <clears throat> we don't cooperate like that, unfortunately. <clears throat> so that's the key. It's pretty simple. It's practical. It's common sense. All right? People play with this idea, but if you're a pastor making more than a living in your city, and it's way more than the average pastor salary, you're being greedy, <clears throat> and you are disqualifying yourself from a biblical standpoint. So now you're probably sitting there saying, okay, that's great, Gene. We know about you, but what about me? How does this apply to me? How does any of this apply to any of you if you're not a pastor? Well, there are definitely some implications. We saw that a little bit in Bible study last week. I brought up some of these verses last week on Sunday. Luke 6.46, Jesus says this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord? You don't do the things that I say. It's a good question. 2 Corinthians 5.10, notice what Paul says, For we, he writes, we must all appear before the tribunal or judgment seat of Christ, so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or worthless. These are for all of us, not just pastors. So, thing is, we have liberty to do what we want outside of those gospel requirements, correct? Yes. Permissible, but not always profitable. It's not without a price. <clears throat> so here's what was making me nervous all week as I prepared. We're at that point. Because I'm going to upset a lot of people this morning. It's no problem. I'm actually pretty good at it. <clears throat> it's in my PD, too. Upset a lot of people. <clears throat> because, heaven forbid, I say anything bad about sports. Can't do that. <laughs> but if you take offense at what I say, I want you to think about this. Ask yourself why you're offended by it. Like if we're calling ourselves, if you're new here today and you're not a Christian, you don't know Jesus, you're off the hook, you're fine. <laughs> we have another talk we need to have. Come see me, please. But if you're a Christian, if you're calling yourselves a Christian, right? That means baby Christ. That means you're following Christ. How is it possible that you would get upset about the criticism of anything outside of the gospel? Think about it. All things for the sake of the gospel. We should be able to give up anything. Really. And that would include anything as trivial as sports, right? Mm. So here's what I want to talk about. Something I don't understand. I didn't grow up as a sports fan. And here's where I'm going to tick a lot of people off. I want to talk about the we people. Okay, now, that's what I've coined them. The we people. Now, these are the people who say that we won the game when their favorite sports team really, in reality, won the game. <laughs> but they could never possibly ever make the team except in their sleep. <laughs> Those are the we people. <clears throat> the armchair quarterbacks. Here's where I'm going with this. The parallel. The we people, they're like the people who are throwing out all the secondary doctrine. They don't care about that. They're like, yeah, 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 the gospel, whatever. That's it. They don't want to do anything else. The actual real players on the team the ones in the game, they're the ones that care about all of Jesus' commands, right? They're the disciplined people doing what the coach said. The we people, no secondary doctrine like we talked about, right? Just the gospel, I'm saved, woo, I can do whatever I want from the couch, no discipline. Players, those are the disciplined people. Now, here's where I'm going too. <laughs> I'm not into sports. I never have been. But I did martial arts, and I was an MMA coach for years. So I get something about it. 
the extreme discipline of the diet. Anyone in this room or watching online who is a boxer, a wrestler, jiu-jitsu fighter, MMA fighter, you know what this is like. Dieting for a fight is crazy. You have to have extreme, extreme discipline. Now, maybe as an MMA coach, it's a different thing, I had the right to claim partnership in a victory. I could say, we won if a fighter won, right? Give him a big hug. Yay, Rocky, we did it. Okay, Mick, you know. <laughs> but I was young. I did more than Mick. I was on the mat with these people, bleeding and sweating it out. I was their sparring partner. I was in my 20s. I could do anything. So maybe I did have a right to say, we won. But I refrained from doing that because... I missed almost the hardest part. I didn't go through the diet with them. In fact, I would order pizzas and send them to their house. <laughs> I didn't really do that, I don't think. But I didn't go through that. It's insane. Now, just if you've never done that or been a part of that, it's not like, oh yeah, I'm on a diet, so that means I'm not going to eat ice cream, and I think I'm going to give that up. No, 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 no. I could show you pictures of some of these fighters, and you would look at them and say, they do not have a pound to lose. Not a pound. They're cut. But from that point, they lose 30 more pounds in just two weeks for the fight. You know how you do that? Baby food. <laughs> Baby food. You grind up food. No salt. No nothing. No carbs. Toward the end, you're drinking distilled water. Towards the end, you're cutting your water so much that some of these guys make weight, and they have to be IV'd back to life. <laughs> it's insane. It's really, really insane, okay? So have that in mind. Think about this, though. It's just two weeks, usually, if you're already in good shape. It's a high discipline. It's really, really hard. As Christians, something just to consider, just throw out there. As Christians, we probably should consider that after Jesus was baptized, he began his ministry by what? Fasting for 40 days with extreme discipline. Are we trying to be like Jesus? Now, if I might be someone who might have the right to claim a victory with a fighter, but I refrain from doing so because I didn't do that, what right then does the undisciplined guy in the audience with the beer gut have to claim a partnership in the victory with a fighter. Wouldn't that sound crazy? It is. So that's why I don't understand the we things, because of where I come from, the background. But here's the thing, the application. It's also not the way true Christianity works. Don't be fooled. It isn't the way some view sports. It's more the way I view MMA, where you can't take credit for someone else's win. You can't take credit for someone else's hard work and discipline. You can't buy your way in either. So don't let the idolatry of the world fool you into thinking that the kingdom of heaven is a spectator sport where you can be a part of the team or buy your way into a win. At the end of your life, what you did with it will be completely on you. You're going to have to make weight. That's the pressure in those kinds of sports. Christianity is not a team sport in that sense nor is it a spectator sport. You'll not get in just because you wore the jersey, bought the season tickets. You don't get to claim victory just because you supported the team. You'll not be able to attach yourself to someone else's win. The only win you can attach yourself to is Jesus' victory on the cross by your gospel decision. That's it. But from that point on, what you do is on you. And you will be judged. We saw that in the scriptures. It wasn't me saying it. Look what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 9, we'll continue there. Don't you know that the runners in a stadium all race, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way to win the prize. Now everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything. However, they do it to receive a crown that will fade away. But we, a crown that will never fade away. Therefore, I do not run like one who runs aimlessly or box like one beating the air. Instead, I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be 
disqualified. Did you catch what Paul said in that last verse? Not a very popular verse. You will not hear a lot of pastors preaching that one on a Sunday morning. Again, we should consider that Jesus began his ministry by exercising extreme discipline. Now, to those who choose to be bystanders or just do the bare minimum, yes, yes, gospel. You may receive eternal life. That's not up to me. That's on God. But we will all be judged for what we have done in the body, good or worthless. To those who discipline themselves, they will receive a crown of righteousness. Paul writes this at the end of his life. 2 Timothy 4, starting at verse 8. There is reserved for me in the future the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. Practically, let's be real. Like, what do you want to hear when you get to heaven? What do you want to hear? I'm going to give you a little homework. You guys love homework, right? Read Matthew 25. Jesus gives two options. He tells the parable of the slaves and then the sheep and the goats. Two options, sheep or goats. One, well done, good and faithful slave. Two, you evil, lazy slave. Which one do you want to hear? Just being real, right? What will the righteous judge say to you on that unavoidable day? I want to show a video here. The reason I'm doing it is because I can't do this teaching that well. It's Francis Chan. I want to say this. I don't agree with everything Francis Chan says all the time. He's a very good teacher. But in this teaching, I agree. It's very good. He kind of owns this. I think he invented this illustration, so I don't want to copy it. Plus, I'm scared of heights. So I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'm not going to do it for you. I apologize for the quality, though. It's the only one we could find. It's kind of low quality, but you'll get the point. So let's take a look at the video. off the team, whatever, you know, just, just there's so much instability, so much that we don't understand, that, that we don't know. For me, growing up, it was, uh, a lot of you guys know, my mom died giving birth to me, and my dad remarried, then my stepmom died in a car accident when I was nine, then my dad got married again, then my dad died of cancer when I was 12, and so I'm in junior high, my mom's dead, my stepmom's dead, my dad's dead. The only close relatives I had were my, my aunt and uncle, George and Sandra. And then when I was in high school, they got in a fight, and my uncle George shot and killed my aunt, and then stuck the gun to his own head, killed himself. So I'm 16 years old, and this is life to me, going, man, what's next? Everything seems to be falling apart, and we get a little worried, we get a little scared. And this is what Christians do, you know, they try to serve God, but then things get a little rocky. And things get a little unstable. And so we go, okay, that was nuts. I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to live like that. Let me, uh, let me hold on. And this is your routine. This is what so many people do. They go, you know what? I'm not going to try anything crazy. I'm just going to sit here. And uh, I'm just going to hold on. And uh, this is what you look like. You just go, uh, this is what people do. You know what? I'm just going to have my nice little family. We're just going to... Um, you know, we're just going to keep to ourselves. We're going to live in a gated community. I'm going to homeschool my kids, make them wear helmets everywhere. I'm going to, um, you know, I'm not going to let them outside because sun has bad rays. I'm going to, um, you know, just on and on and on. And you just live your life in the safety of I don't want to do anything crazy for God. I just, I just want to, you know, go to church on Sundays and maybe give like 2%. Um, and uh, maybe serve, help the nursery, because I feel guilty. And then you do this your whole life, and then you, you go, your greatest prayer is like, God, you know what? I would love to die in my sleep and not even feel it, and then just go up to heaven. And so th you want to die like this, just in your sleep, oh, right in the middle of a dream, good dream, the dream you're going to heaven, and you don't even feel it. And then suddenly you wake up, you stand before the judge, and you go, Now, if, uh, could you imagine 
Could you imagine watching the Olympics? You know? And some girl does that. Just gets up there, starts straddling the thing, and then steps off and goes... <laughs> what is the judge supposed to do on the card? You see, and to me, I go, man, that's the routine that so many Christians are headed for. That's the routine, the boring, I do nothing crazy because I don't want to fall. I, I, that's the routine that they're going to live, and then one day it's going to be a shock because they're going to step off that balance beam and realize they're standing before the judge. They're standing before the judge, and you think he's going to look at that routine and go, wow, well done. Well done. You live the safest life possible. You didn't slip. You didn't fall. See, that's not the life that God's called us to. That's where the majority will head. But I don't want to go where the majority goes. It was really funny up until that last part. <laughs> Francis Chan. Next time somebody says, Gene, you went really hard, I'm going to invite Francis in. <laughs> Contrast. He's right. We can. We can do it the easy way. But what do you want when you get there? What's your dismount going to be like? So, personal application. Some practical stuff from chapter 9. Now, this is important. One is discerning who we listen to. Who we listen to. It's what guides us. Who's going to be our coach? It's important. We have these requirements for leadership for a reason. Titus 1, 1 Timothy 3. There are requirements for pastors. If someone doesn't meet them, including not being greedy for money, they're disqualified. And after reading what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, we might also want to consider whether they're disciplined or not. Just being real. It's in there. A lot of pastors ignore that one. Two, where is money in your list of priorities? Where was it for Paul? Are we exercising our faith through our finances? Are we living generously? Are we hugging that balance beam? What are we doing? Are we putting our money where our mouth is? Paul was able to give it up. And the Bible doesn't teach that it's only for pastors or elders. I knew where you were going there. It doesn't. This is what Paul writes to Timothy. 1 Timothy 6, 7. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. He continues... Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God, who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share, storing up for themselves a good reserve for the age to come so that they may take hold of life that is real. Are you investing in temporary things? or eternal things. Jesus says this in Matthew 6. Don't. Do not collect for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But collect for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He continues. No one no one can be a slave of two masters, since either he will hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot be slaves of God and money. Notice that Jesus does not give a third option. Doesn't give us a way out of that one. Well done, good and faithful slave. I think that one was over here. Or you evil, lazy slave. That's it. Paul is a slave of God, not money. He writes that to Titus, Titus 1.1, self-identified, slave of God. He knows that teaching. 
He cannot be yoked, attached to, led by, slaves of, both Jesus and money. He gives this teaching here. Then Jesus told them a parable in Luke 12. The rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I will do this, he said. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, self, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? That's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, it's important to note that this teaching and the one in Matthew 6 are both followed by teachings on anxiety. Why? It's about faith. Someone needs to fill up their barns doesn't necessarily have a money issue. It's a faith issue. Jesus clearly teaches that it's not okay to go storing up all this stuff for yourself when it could be used to help others around you. We need to make a living, not amass a lack of faith fund. So my encouragement to you, encouragement, is to exercise your faith, little by little, with your finances. To be generous toward God, toward the people whom he loves. Generosity with your finances is an exercise of that faith, an exercise of trust in the Lord and a help to the community around you through your church. We are a church that believes in serving our community here and abroad. Missions abroad, missions local. We saw some of that last week with PRC. It was awesome. They're doing really good things. We're also, if you don't know, you haven't been here for a while, we're serving our community in the park, feeding people. After church, every single Sunday, we have food available in the loft. Here's the awesome part. Last week, we filled up the loft. Hallelujah. We filled up the loft. Now, we need to set up tables in the room next door to it so we can feed more people. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> That's a good thing. Don't be scared, guys. It's not a trick question. It's a really good thing. We started out and we got here. We've been here for about a year and a half. We talked about it at staff meetings. Hey, would it be really cool if we had a potluck, right? Where we could just feed people. Todd and Tracy, are, they're bringing people in. They might need food. Let's feed them once a month. Okay, we can do that. It's going to be really hard. We pulled it off. Now we're doing it every single week and people are serving joyfully. Sprout is giving us food every week for the park, for the church. It's easy. I had lunch with someone last week, and it was really funny because he just blurted it out. We we're talking about it. We're doing it every week. This is really great. And, you know, he kind of just sat there and he said, yeah, you're just kind of doing like what Jesus said. I was like, yeah, kind of the bare minimum, quite frankly. So it's a challenge to me as a pastor. But here's the thing. It's an encouragement, too. We've got to do that. We've got to challenge ourselves, right? So back to sports. We don't grow. We don't gain muscle. We don't get bigger, whatever it is. We don't get to our goal without being pushed, without challenging ourselves, without putting in the hard work. Faith is the same. It's no different. You've got to try, right? But do you try to bench 400 pounds right away? No. You know, you get your form right, you try with the bar. That's what tithing is all about. That's what we do that. We just say, okay, we just try the 10% and we'll just do that. It's easy. Right? Automatic faithfulness. But God isn't calling you to stay there. Serve. Be the hands and feet of Jesus. Help your church. Get plugged in. If you're not plugged in, come see me. I'll get you plugged in. We can literally see the love and radiance of God multiplying here in our church. Through the faith that leads to generosity. So, if you're not yet on the field, I'm going to invite you. This is your official invitation. I'm going to invite you to be a part of the team. I'm going to invite you to get off the couch, <laughs> out of the seat, and into the game. My prayer for you is that your routine on the beam would be glorifying to God. Amen?